Welcome, welcome. So the last of the special senses um, that we're going to discuss are olfaction and gustation, by which we mean smell and taste. Um, olfaction of, is, of course, smell, and gustation is taste. These are complementary senses, meaning they kind of go hand in hand with each other. And what our chemical senses do, because these are using chemoreceptors, is they basically let us know if something is good for us or if something is bad for us, right? When you take a whiff of spoiled milk, it smells bad, and your body's like, nope, don't want that, because it might be toxic to us. Um, whereas if something smells um, delicious, um, like, uh, I don't know, steak and onions cooking together, um, I think that always smells pretty good. Um, that is a way of letting our body know, oh, hey, this is something that we should consume. This is something that we could potentially um, enjoy and, and be useful. Um, and so they really kind of work uh, kind of hand in glove with each other uh, to help us either avoid things that might be bad for us or um, consume things that could be good for us. Um, both of these special senses use chemoreceptors, um, so they're going to respond to chemicals in our food and in our kind of smells. Um, but in order for our senses to function, those chemicals have to actually be dissolved in solution. Um, so if it can't dissolve in your uh, kind of nasal cavity fluids, or it can't dissolve in your saliva, then we can't actually smell or taste it. In lab, you guys are actually going to do a, a little test with some sugar packets where you're gonna dry your tongue um, and kind of see what happens in terms of your ability to taste the sugar on a dry tongue. So we'll talk about olfaction first. The organ for smell is what we call the olfactory epithelium, which um, are these neurons here that hang out at the roof of the nasal cavity running through the foramina in the ethmoid bone up to the olfactory bulb. Um, so the olfactory neurons themselves are bipolar and they have these little olfactory cilia cells, um, kind of hair on the, on the bottom of them that get covered in mucus. That's part of the kind of nasal fluids in which our smells will dissolve. Um, there are also several, um, kind of supporting cells around the bipolar cells that help kind of cushion the receptor cells themselves. At the base of the epithelium are a bunch of stem cells um, because um, by the act of smelling, um, our olfactory bipolar neurons can actually get damaged. Um, and so um, every 30 to 60 days, month to two months, your olfactory epithelial cells actually replace themselves, um, which is really, really different for neurons. Most neurons um, are not really very good at that. They're usually amitotic. Um, but these stem cells uh, are not. They will make new um, olfactory cells for us. Um, the olfactory um, bipolar cells will connect then to the olfactory bulb, um, which is cranial nerve number one, and then the olfactory tract will send that information um, to your um, olfactory cortex in your brain. Um, one of the things I want to point out, right, so is here we can see the air inhaled here. Um, you'll notice that the inside of your nasal cavity um, isn't kind of smooth. It has these things called conche on it, which are basically like protuberances in the walls of the cavity. Um, and it kind of interrupts the flow of the air so that the air as it's inhaled um, has more time to be warmed and humidified um, in terms of our respiratory system. But it also... Um, gives our olfactory epithelium plenty of time to um, sense whatever smells happen to be in the air that we inhale. Um, so now many smells um, contain the, literally hundreds of different odorants, um, a smell-causing chemical. Um, when you, what you think of as the, the, the smell of a rose or the, the smell of a piece of fruit or uh, cookies in the oven isn't just a single kind of odorant. It's actually probably a combination of 
odorants. Um, we can smell about 10,000 odors, our, um, us humans. Um, we have 400 um smell genes that are basically activated only in um, the nose area and each of these genes encodes for kind of a different unique receptor protein that responds typically to one or a few of these odorants. An odorant binds onto kind of several different receptors and again one odor, one smell is going to have maybe hundreds of odorants in it and the kind of combination of which receptors get activated um, by which different kind of odorants, that is why we have the kind of a range in terms of the things that we can smell. So the olfactory receptors themselves are activated when some sort of odorant binds onto them. That initiates a cascade of reactions that eventually opens some cation channels for sodium and calcium in the same channel. But both of those are positively charged cations and they will both influx into the neuron which will depolarize that olfactory neuron um, and lead to the release of neurotransmitters um, to the next neuron in the chain in order to send the signal up to our brain. But the calcium influx is a little different than the sodium influx, and that calcium influx is what is responsible for the fact that our olfactory receptors actually adapt fairly quickly. Um, we can we get a, a a, a decreased response like the longer the stimulus is sustained with us. Um, so think about um, you know putting your perfume or cologne on in the morning, right? When you first smell it, like and you first put it on, you're like, wow, it's, it's really strong, um, but very quickly you are not noticing it because it's a sustained stimulus for your body um, and your olfactory receptors stop noticing it after a while. In terms of our pathway, you can see here are all our olfactory cells. Here are some of those supporting cells I mentioned earlier, and then the little kind of neuron stem cells that make new olfactory cells. You can see here's the little uh, olfactory cilium coated in that mucus. Um, so the receptors will bind onto the olfactory neurons. Um, that will then um, activate these olfactory neurons. They then travel up through the uh, cribriform plate in the ethmoid bone and will synapse with the mitral cells here in the olfactory bulb. The mitral cells <clears throat> then um, kind of merge as the olfactory tract, which tracks the information to your olfactory cortex. Now, unlike all of our other senses, um, vision, hearing, um, taste, um, the olfactory information actually bypasses the thalamus. It does not have kind of a relay station um, in the thalamus. It goes directly to the olfactory cortex. Some of it also goes to the frontal lobe, uh, particularly that prefrontal cortex, um, so that you can be like, oh, hey, I am smelling, um, well, right now I have pineapple on my on my table. I'm, I'm smelling a pineapple. Um, my ability to not only smell it, but say, oh, hey, I know what this is, um, is my olfactory cortex and my frontal lobe. Um, and then we have um, the limbic system, right, which includes um, parts of the hypothalamus, parts of the amygdala, the mammillary body. Um, odors are really strong um, evocations of emotion and memory. Um, sometimes a very specific smell can evoke uh, a memory, bring up a memory in your um, in your brain can evoke some sort of emotional response um, and that is usually there um, working through those different parts of the limbic system. If we look at then gustation, um, we're really talking about our taste buds, which are located on the papillae of the tongue. Um, you have about 10,000 taste buds on your tongue, um, most of them. Uh, there are a couple on kind of the epiglottis back here and on the, the pharynx or throat and a little 
a little bit on the soft palate in the cheeks, but most of your taste buds are on one of these papillae, right? So the fungiform papillae are the ones that give your tongue the kind of bumps. Back here we have the folate papillae, kind of on the back sides of the tongue, and then the circumvallate or vallate papillae make this kind of V shape back here. Um, Within the taste bud, you have two types of um, modified epithelial cells. You have the um, gustatory cells themselves, um, and then you also have some basal epithelial cells that can divide and replace the gustatory cells. And because the do remember, this is our tongue, right? So imagine putting something like really too hot in your mouth, right? You're going to burn your tongue. Well, that damages your taste cells, your gustatory cells. And so they need to be replaced um, about once a week, actually, week, week and a half. Um, you can see that there's a tiny little pore on the surface of the papillae. And that is how um, the odorant actually comes into the taste bud in order to activate one of these gustatory epithelial cells. Um, so we actually have um, gustatory epithelial cells for kind of five basic tastes. We have sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and something that's called umami, which is a Japanese word. Um, sweet is responding to things like saccharin, sugars, um, carbohydrates. Sour is responding to hydrogen ions. Salty is responding to uh, inorganic salts, metal ions, things like magnesium, sodium. Uh, bitter tends to be um, kind of alkaloid things. Um, quinine, nicotine, aspirin is very bitter. That's right, right? That's why if you put the aspirin in your mouth and you don't swallow it right away, it tastes terrible um, because it's activating your bitter receptors. Um, and then umami is responding to uh, particularly the amino acids glutamate and aspartate, so more kind of protein-y type stuff. We also um, have, or at least there's growing evidence for um, a possible sixth taste, and that is long chain fatty acids, um, so fats, lipids, um, and um, this may be why um, we tend to like kind of really fatty, greasy foods um, because we may actually have a, a taste receptor for it. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen kind of one of those taste maps where like you have the different maps of your tongue and like salty is up here and sweet is on the side. That is nonsense. Um, each of your taste buds contains a gustatory epithelial cell for all of our five basic tastes, and again, as possibly as well as this possible sixth taste. The tastes themselves um, have homeostatic value. Um, you know, we don't eat things just because they taste good, although we, we do eat things because they taste good. Um, this is our body's way of saying, oh, hey, we need these things. So for instance, um, Carbohydrates, sweet, the sweet taste, that is going to give us um, glucose, which is what we need to make ATP to have energy to power our body. Um, salty foods make sure that we have um, adequate solute um, kind of levels in our body so that we maintain kind of adequate um, kind of water balance and blood pressure. Sour includes things um, that might... Um, include something um, that might be harmful to us. Um, so for instance, um, if something is uh, not quite ripe enough, right, it doesn't taste as good, um, and we shouldn't really be eating it until it's ripe enough, um, it's going to taste more sour. Um, umami is that protein flavor, um, that's that, like that meat flavor, um, that makes sure that we go out and we eat proteins so that we get amino acids so we can build muscle and um, have enzymes that make all the biochemical reactions in our body function. Um, and then bitter is more about like kind of poisonous things, right? Again, think about the aspirin in your mouth too long, right? It tastes terrible. 
horrible. Um, t- things that tend to be toxic to our bodies tend to have a very bitter taste. And so we, you know, way back in our evolutionary history, we put something in our mouth that was toxic to us. It was bitter. And we, t- we spit it out right away so that we didn't consume the thing that was toxic to us. Um, so all of our various tastes, whether that's the carbs for the sweet, the salty, in terms of the hydrogen, uh, the um, kind of sodium ions, sour, and our hydrogen ions, umami, with our amino acids, um, they're all about kind of making sure that we're eating things that are useful to our body and not consuming things that are toxic to our bodies. The chemicals themselves, the different food chemicals, they're going to dissolve in our saliva. They then kind of inch their way and diffuse their way into that little taste pore, and then they can contact the gustatory hair cells. Um, The chemicals kind of binding onto the gustatory cells then depolarizes the membrane for that particular gustatory cell, and we'll get a, a release of neurotransmitters. Salty and sour salty sodium ions, sour hydrogen ions, they directly depolarize. When a particular um, food chemical uh, contacts the salty or sour gustatory cells, um, since they are cations themselves, hydrogen, sodium, they can directly influx into the um, the cell and cause depolarization. The bitter, sweet, and umami, since they're responding to things like amino acids or glucose, they actually do indirect depolarization. When one of these food chemicals binds onto the hair cells, uh, the gustatory cells, you get a whole series of reactions using these G proteins that eventually open ion channels for calcium. Calcium then influxes into the gustatory cell that gives us our depolarization, which results then in a neurotransmitter release. Um, The gustatory cells actually have different threshold values than like your standard neuron, Um, and they're actually different from each other. And the ones that are most sensitive, that have the uh, lowest threshold value, are the bitter receptors, because they are the ones that are really looking at stuff that is toxic to us. Um, And so since the bitter receptors are most sensitive, um, they're activated really quickly so that we quickly spit out whatever it is that tastes terrible to us. The pathway that the um, taste information travels is from the um, taste buds um, through cranial nerves 7 and 9 up to the brainstem, then to the thalamus, and then finally to the gustatory cortex. Um, And then some information also then goes to the limbic system so that we can be like, oh yes, that tastes so good. And we get that kind of enjoyment from it. Um, We also get some gustatory information that travels along the vagus nerve um, from um, kind of lower in the pharynx and the epiglottis. Now, um, much of what we think of as taste um, is actually dependent on other kind of senses, particularly our sense of smell. Um, The reason nothing tastes as good when you're sick and congested is that your sense of smell is blocked. um, And taste is about 80% smell. Um, And so when your smell senses are not working quite as well, your food senses are not working as well either. Um, But then we have things like temperature and texture, right? If food is really super hot, you can't taste anything. If um, sometimes the food is really cold, you can't taste anything. Um, The textures of food influences kind of whether we like food or not. Um, For instance, asparagus. I love asparagus, except when they're super mushy because I think they're gross then. But when they're nice and crispy, um, then I think they're great, right? So um, things like temperature and and texture can affect our food as well. Um, And then spicy foods um, actually activate, if you're a spicy food kind of person, um, they're activating actually not a taste receptor, but they're actually activating nociceptors or pain receptors. Um, So if you like spicy food, um, essentially you're a a little little bit of a masochist. Um, But that is how our sense of um, taste and smell work, um, and they do very much work together.